Hi, I'm Alex Tichy. I'm a graduate student here in the Cool Worlds Lab, part of the Department of Astronomy at Columbia University. And for the last few years, I've been working with Professor David Kipping on the search for exomoons. And these are moons in other planetary systems outside of our own solar system. It's really exciting work. So far, nobody has uh, produced an unambiguous detection of one of these exomoons. We're trying to be the first, and uh, I think we're hot on the trail. You may have heard of one particular exomoon candidate. We've talked about it here on the channel before, and it's gotten some media attention. I'm talking about Kepler-1625b. This is a planet uh, about the size of Jupiter, orbiting a star some 7,000 light years away. We identified this exomoon candidate in the Kepler data a full two years ago, uh, and we've been working on it ever since. So, a brief recap. Back in 2016, we were working with the Kepler data, and we identified this system, Kepler-1625b. It had three transits in the Kepler data. And once again, a transit is what happens when a planet passes in front of a star uh, from our point of view. If you're monitoring the brightness of that star over time, you'll see a little dip in the intensity of the starlight, because the planet, of course, is blocking out a little bit of that starlight. If you have a moon around that planet, you'll see a big dip from the planet and a smaller dip from the moon. So we had the Kepler data and this is exactly what we saw. We saw a big dip of course from the planet transiting and then we saw smaller dips due to what we thought might be the presence of a moon. Uh, we ran a bunch of tests and it looked pretty convincing but it wasn't quite enough to claim an unambiguous detection at that time. We really wanted more data and so we proposed for time on the Hubble Space Telescope and we were rewarded that time about 40 hours on Hubble to uh, look at this transit. And this is uh, pretty remarkable. It's, it's fairly rare that Hubble spends so much time staring at a single target. We finally finished our analysis of the Hubble observation and we're ready to publish our results. So what is it that we see? Well, first let me walk you through how we perform the observation and some of the analysis, and then I'll get to uh, what we're actually claiming. To perform the Hubble observation, we take a series of pictures, a series of long exposures, 232 in all, each exposure lasting about five minutes. What we want to do is observe for as much time as possible with a single exposure, collect as much light as we can before the detector saturates. And when we take these images, they don't look quite like images of the sky you're used to. Instead, we split the light out from all of the stars across uh, the detector using this thing called a grism. The grism spreads the light of the star across the detector. Uh, you'll see a long strip of light in the image. And what that does is it gives us wavelength information about the target. And that's really great because it can tell you, perhaps, if you see some bump or wiggle in the data, whether or not that uh, is something happening on the surface of the star, whether there's some object passing in front of the star, and in some cases this even allows you uh, to say something about what makes up the atmosphere of the planet that you're looking at. So, we take all of these images, we add up all the light from those strips that I was mentioning, uh, and from here we're able to produce what's called a light curve. This is just a series of brightness measurements over time, and this is where we see uh, those transit dips uh, that I mentioned before. We see the planet transit, and hopefully we'll see uh, the moon transiting as well. Now, this all sounds pretty simple, but what's amazing is that even with these exquisitely sophisticated instruments like the Kepler Space Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope, there are still a number of known issues with these telescopes that we must account for as we analyze the data. The detector is called a CCD, that stands for Charge Coupled Device, and what happens is the light comes in, it strikes the detector, and those photons are converted into electrons. And as the exposure goes on, we accumulate more and more of these electrons, and when the exposure is over with, we count up the number of electrons, and that tells us how bright the pixel is. Uh, but we know that these pixels have small differences in their levels of sensitivity. Some are more sensitive than others. It's a small change, but it's absolutely important that we account for this uh, because it's a small signal that we're looking for. We also see thermal fluctuations in the data. Hubble is in orbit around the Earth, and so as the observations go on, the telescope warms or cools, expands or contracts, and this is an infrared detector that we're using, and so we detect these small differences in the temperature of the telescope, and you can actually see it in the data, and we've got to correct for that as well. The next thing we have to do is deal with trends in the data, and we see both short-term and long 
duration trends in the data. The short duration trends show up as these things that look like ramps or hooks uh, in the data. And this is thought to be due to charge trapping in the CCD. We've accumulated all of these electrons in each pixel, and when the exposure is over with, we flush all those electrons out in order to count them. But Turns out we can't flush them all out. Some of those electrons stay behind. And as you move to the next exposure, you're accumulating more and more and more electrons. And eventually, uh, you see these big ramps. Finally, we see long duration trends in the data. This has been seen in many similar observations in the past. So at long last, we've got our final cleaned light curve. What do we do now? Well. For the moon search, we have to be able to build an entirely self-consistent moon model. What does that mean? It means that your model has to be able to explain every event that's ever been observed, meaning we have to be able to explain everything that we can see in the original three transits from the Kepler data, as well as the new transit uh, from the Hubble data. But how do we know that the moon model is really the best model? In order to do that, we have to compare it to other models. We ultimately tried four basic models, and by comparing how well each of those models perform, we get a sense of which model best explains the data. The first one is a regular old vanilla planet model. Just a single planet in the system, no moons in the system, no other planets around, and if this were the correct model, we should expect the planet to transit like clockwork. Goes around every single time we know exactly uh, when it ought to transit. The second model is the same as the first, only now we allow the timing of the individual transits to be free parameters. We're freely fitting those timings. And so we're testing whether or not the planet really does come around like clockwork, or whether the planet comes in a little early sometimes, a little later other times. This would be the planet wobbling around a bit. These are called transit timing variations, or TTVs for short. We're looking for statistically significant TTVs. The third model sounds a bit weird, honestly, but it's well-motivated. We call it the zero-radius moon model. And what this is is a model of the moon in the system. It has some definite mass, but it has no size at all, no radius. And what this does is it allows us to look for the gravitational influence of the moon, but we're not expecting it to block out any light from the star, and therefore it's not trying to fit any dips in the starlight. And finally, we have the full moon model, which produces both the gravitational influence of the moon, as well as uh, producing a dip in the intensity of starlight due to the moon passing in front of the star. Now the moon has some size, and so it's able to block out some of the starlight. After we run all the models, we get a number. We call it the evidence. And this tells you how well the model is explaining the data. Now, one number by itself really doesn't tell you a whole lot. But in comparing one evidence against another, then we get a sense of which model is performing better. First, we compare the planet-only model with the transit timing variation model. And when we do that, we see pretty strong evidence that these transit timing variations, these TTVs, really are statistically significant. And we kind of already knew that, because when we performed the Hubble observation, the planet transited a full 78 minutes earlier than we anticipated. So this confirms it. We're pretty sure we've got TTVs in the system. And that's great, because we expect moons to produce these TTVs. But it's not a slam dunk, because while a moon could be responsible for this, it's also plausible that an external planet perturbing Kepler-1625b uh, could produce these TTVs as well. Now, to be clear, no other planets have been observed in the system so far, but it's certainly plausible that something else could be there. Next, we test the zero-radius moon model, and when we do that, we see a modest improvement over the previous models, which suggests that there are other gravitational effects, other timing effects that we're seeing here that cannot necessarily be explained by another planet in the system. And finally, when we do the full moon model, this model consistently outperforms the others. No matter how we remove those long duration trends that I was mentioning before, the moon model always wins. So, great. All of the numbers are saying, that's a moon. It's really there. Awesome. Is that the end of the story? Well, uh, not exactly. You see, this is very complicated stuff. For one thing, the dip that we attribute uh, to this exomoon happens right at the very end 
of the Hubble observation. In two of our three different runs, using different uh, methods for removing those long-term trends that I was talking about, the model suggests that we've not seen the end of the moon transit, meaning the moon comes in and we don't see it go out. That's really tough. We'd really like to see the moon begin its transit and end its transit and then have the star go back to what it was doing before. In two of the three cases, the model suggests we're not seeing that. And so that would be very convincing, but unfortunately the data uh, ran out before we got to that point. Then you wonder, could there be any other astrophysical explanation for what we're seeing? Could this be, for example, activity on the surface of the star? Well, to test that, we go back to that wavelength information that I told you about. Remember the light smeared out across the detector. If we were seeing something like a star spot, say, we would expect this dip to look different at different wavelengths. By contrast, if we're seeing a moon coming across, then that dip should look the same, basically, at all wavelengths. The good news is we perform this test. We look at it uh, in the blue end, and we look at it at the red end, and the signal appears to be consistent at both ends of the spectrum. Could it be something else going on with the instrument? Well, to answer that question, we start by looking again at that comparison star uh, that we see in the image. Do we see a similar dip in the intensity of starlight with the comparison star that we see in our target star, the dip that we're attributing to the moon? And the answer is no. Not really. What about the telescope moving a little bit at the time of the moon signal? You know, we know that the telescope is flying through space, and I told you before that the pixel sensitivities are slightly different. Could the telescope have moved in such a way that the target is now falling on different pixels, and that could explain the moon dip? Well, it turns out we can actually measure that motion, and while we do see a little bit of drifting, I'm talking about something like a tenth of a pixel over a 40-hour period. That's incredible stability, by the way. We don't see anything unusual happening at the time of the moon signal. Basically, our job as scientists is to be skeptical of extraordinary claims, even when that extraordinary claim is coming from us, and to test every assertion and make sure that the hypothesis holds up. And at this point, we've basically run out of good ideas for testing this thing, and the moon has withstood all of them. So what's the deal? Why aren't we just saying, here it is, we found the moon, it's there, case closed. This is an extraordinary claim, and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. This is potentially the first exomoon, but that's not the only thing that makes it extraordinary. The moon, as far as we can tell, is about the size of Neptune, and that is something that hardly anybody is anticipated. Every step of the way, David and I have been anxious to let the data and the analysis speak for itself and let the community pass judgment on our claims. Uh, have we uh, done everything correctly? Are there other effects that we haven't accounted for? This is really the essence of peer review and the scientific process. Ultimately, we think this object really deserves to be observed again. Uh, the next time the planet transits in May 2019, and by the way, we've got a pretty clean prediction for what the light curve ought to look like at that time. That's another key part of the scientific process. You have a hypothesis, that hypothesis makes a prediction, and then you test that prediction and see whether or not you're hypothesis holds water. The next transit is in May 2019, and we hope we have a chance to observe it. Until then, uh, this will probably have to remain an exomoon candidate, but we think it's a very exciting candidate, and we're very excited for the moon search going forward in the next couple of years. Thank you so much for watching. We've really appreciated the support of the public as well as the astronomical community at every step of this process. And if you're interested in hearing more about this ExoMoon candidate, my advisor and co-author David Kipping is uh, putting together another video talking a little bit more about the uh, analysis of the Kepler data, the history of the moon search, the history of the exoplanet search, as well as some interesting new questions arising out of this system. How might you get a moon the size of Neptune? Uh, there are no easy answers, but there are some great new questions being raised. So please check out that video when you're done. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, rate, and share. And stay curious. We'll see you around the galaxy.